Well, hi everyone and welcome to this month's There's More event, the last one of the semester. We want to begin by recognizing that USD is on the land of the Kumeyaay. For millennia, the Kumeyaay people have been, been a part of this land. This land has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced them for many generations in a relationship of balance and harmony. As members of the USD community, we acknowledge this legacy. We promote this balance and harmony. We find inspiration from this land, the land of the Kumeyaay. With that in mind, a little more about our event today. There's More is a live storytelling initiative put on by the Humanities Center and Changemaker Hub, along with our production team. Our goal with these stories is to bring out raw and meaningful experiences of the human condition. The stories come in many different forms, which we categorize as more human, more insight, more change, or more dialogue. Every month, I and my fellow student producer, Amolia Madali, if you wanna wave, put on this live event, focusing on a different theme or idea. Although this semester is our first time doing this virtually. We then take the recordings of the event, produce them and publish them as our There's More podcast. And with that, a quick reminder that you can find us on iTunes at There's More and at there'smore.sandiego.edu if you wanna hear even more awesome stories. I wanna thank our faculty producer and advisor, Diane Keeling, who has been such an awesome guiding force in the execution of tonight's event. I also wanna thank our sponsors, Noel Norton, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Lindy Villa with the Humanities Center, and Mike Williams and Juan Carlos Rivas with the Changemaker Hub. Our theme for this month is home. This theme, like all of our themes, can be interpreted in any way the storytellers wish. This theme felt especially relevant to the moment with all of the relationships currently shifting between homes, people, and the meaning of home in general. Before we begin, I'd like to encourage audience members to have their screen on speaker view and to mute their audio. Also, if storytellers seem to be having problems with Wi-Fi, I know that turning off the audience's video feeds helps as well. Although it is nice, of course, for the speakers to see audience reactions to their stories. We are also going to be opening up the floor for questions or comments at the very end of all these stories. So please keep those insights and questions in mind for the end. That being said, Let's get started. So first off, we have an assistant professor in counseling and marital and family development as part of the School of Leadership and Education Studies, or SOULS, Ned Gobulovich. Did I say that right? Hopefully. <laughs> um, his fun fact is that he was once featured in a video game. And today he will be sharing a story with us. And you can begin whenever you are ready. I appreciate the invite, and I must say, for me to be here today, Dr. Keeling has to uh, had to do some encouraging because uh, a story of home is quite an intricate topic uh, for me, and it's usually not easy for me to gather my thoughts uh, on this topic. I moved many times uh, over my lifetime, so what what home is has changed dramatically, and then also what home was changed for me even without moving. Uh, so it's uh, quite difficult sometimes for me to even talk or rather put my uh, uh, my mind around this. And what home is has morphed, morphed for me over the years. And when thinking about the meaning of my conversation today, I think what I would like it to be is maybe changing or expanding the idea of what home is, or maybe at least giving some new areas of consideration what is but to to start it off and give you a little bit of maybe um, a cultural framing of kind of where I come from or how I even start conceptualizing this um, word home in my language Serbian also means house it's kuća so to use you use one word to rep to to represent what this home idea is as well as the physical location or where you reside so that is very much, that's how my language and my culture sees it very much tied to this physical, physical place. So for me, initially, those were very inseparable. And on top of that, I grew up in the, on the Balkan Peninsula, geographic region that was uh, torn by wars for centuries. So a huge part of this ethnic literature speaks to this pride of taking home, of refuge, of being home, and this need to return home. 
uh, when there, when people were displaced by war. So this uh, imagination or image or in pride in coming back was very much present in literature and kind of, of me realizing who I am as a being, as an individual, but also et ethnically who I am uh, with my people. Um, uh, so going from there and growing up during the first years, the formative of imagining home became this thing that I was returning to after school, after the, the trips, home became this physical place. However, when I was 14 years old, I left home. I moved away. I was recruited by a sports academy that was about 12 hours away. So I moved. And that is the very first time that now home became a remote thing for me. There was something that, um, that didn't exist for me in present, but rather it was something I was thinking about and returning to. And just because of the schedule where I lived, we got to go home about twice a year for the holidays and, and the summertime. Uh, so at that time was the first time in my life that it concretely became this thing to which I was returning to. And then at that time, home was still very much identified as this place that I go to, but it was also expanded to include my family. So returning home was also synonymous to returning to see my parents and my brother and my friends, because at that time, that's, uh, that's all I had uh, there. I lived there for about five years, and then next transition in my life and change for how I conceptualized home became at 18 when I moved and decided to come to the United States to study. And at that time, the notion of home changed again. It came from being just this place or my hometown, friends and family, to home now becomes a, a whole country. Um, and I was when I was referring to going back home, I was referring to now a, a broader place of origin, what it was, uh, what it was, uh, what it was for me. So in all these transitions of how I was relating first to a place, an object, then to my city, then to my country, was changing. And at each point, I was very motivated by forward thinking about the things that I was achieving, things and the goals that I was, that were kind of propelling me to go to. And there was very little looking back. So my, excuse me, my entire focus was on the things I was gaining, uh, but it really didn't set in with me until this notion of a foreigner in the United States came to mind that I was also losing, uh, losing a lot. And that became very prominent for me one times, like maybe two or three years in uh, when I was returning back home and uh, people back home learned that I'm called Ned in the United States and they started adopting that nickname for me. So it transitioned from being the nickname I grew up with to being Ned. And then I started being referred to as the American uh, when I go home. And so that is the, the, the time I was starting to realize for when I go back home, I become an American. When I'm in America, I'm Serbian or Montenegrin. So I was, having in some sense multiple homes in other no home at all and i think for me that was also highlighted or maybe intensified by what i mentioned earlier is that i also changed many homes without ever moving i i grew up in yugoslavia uh, then i lived in uh, federation of states of yugoslavia then I lived in Serbian Montenegro and I lived in Montenegro and my physical address have never changed. So I lived in four countries without ever moving. Um, so in many of those transitions, I, I was losing a lot of pieces of what, what I was and who I was to be. And for many points in time, I did not like uh, the political, um, the, ma the main political narrative I was very much in, in the United States today. And in many points, I, I willingly gave up parts of my identity, parts of calling myself a Montenegrin. I gave that up because I didn't like what the political narrative stood for in the country at the time. And it took me years to realize that I gave it up to someone 
who doesn't have the right to claim it and that's mine as much as they have the right for it uh, as well. So in kind of a summary, I know that my time is, uh, is coming to an end. Um, I first I apologize for, for fragmentation in my story. I think it's probably parallel to, to my experience of the notion of home as well. But in kind of looking back, I realized that over the years, I have lost many things that have represented home for me, but I have also gained uh, many. And then there are some things that I will never get back, but I think there are also things that will never be taken away uh, from me as well. Thank you so much, Ned, for sharing your story today. You have such a unique um, perspective on the idea of home. So um, thank you for sharing. Um, and next up, we have Ellie Frank, a freshman undergraduate student who really enjoys collecting rocks, minerals, and fossils. Um, and Ellie will be sharing a song and a story with us today. Um, and Ellie, you can begin whenever you're ready. So first of all, I want to thank everyone for allowing me to be here. As a freshman year student, I wasn't exactly expecting to be asked to speak at an event. So this was exciting. Um, let me turn on my, I have to turn on my thing for a second. Okay, so I'm going to start with the story. So I, I promise this will this will be about home. It just doesn't it doesn't quite get there for a little while. I went to the same summer camp for eight years. Soon after I got there, it didn't really take me very long to figure out the other kids in my cabin didn't really like me very well, or they'd just rather talk to somebody else. Most of them knew each other already, and I was the new one. It didn't help that we liked different things either. I like to catch tadpoles where they generally preferred to, well, not do that. Looking back, there was a fair amount of bullying that I tolerated. Still, if I was lucky after dinner, while I crunched my way up that gravel trail mountain, I would look up and I would see that the whole sky had turned cotton candy pink. I'd catch a firefly or two on my way and hold them in my hands as tiny glowy travel companions until I arrived at my cabin. I would climb to the top of my bunk bed where the pillow was still slightly damp with that morning's dew, but I didn't mind and would throw my giant fuzzy brown comforter over my head and sleep. That place was home to me. When I first went to New Zealand, the first thing we did was go on a hike. While everyone was swimming, I opted instead to take photos of the local plants. I felt like some kind of National Geographic scientist scouring for the most photogenic plants. I found one whose leaves aligned in just a way to create all the colors of a rainbow. We didn't stay long in any one place, but that trip might have been the most fun I have ever had. When the windows of the van fogged up, my friends and I would cover the whole thing with stupid looking smiley faces and we would count the number of cows and sheep that we saw to see who would find the most on our way down the roads. One day we explored a cave. They took us all in inner tubes to float down an underground river. And we all interlocked tubes, each person laying their head on another person's legs. And they turned off all the lights. The only way I could describe what I saw was a galaxy. I swear, if you told me that's what the universe looked like, I would believe you. But apparently, they were glowworms. The guides told us also that this portion of the cave had fantastic acoustics, and most of the acapella club just happened to be there. Floating down that river and singing, hearing the reverberations without being able to see anyone, only the tiny glowing dots on the ceiling, that was home to me. I wasn't expecting to, but since I've been away for college, I found myself thinking about my parents' home back in Missouri, where I'm from. My brother had to come home from college early, so I'm kind of alone in my aloneness, if that makes any sense. Some nights after dinner, I would stay after instead of retreating to my room like usual, and I'd sit silently in the living room with my parents, and don't forget the dogs. We would just sit there together 
and sometimes talk, but not always. We would just be in each other's company while the background murmuring of some old show on the television put me to sleep with at least one dog laid beside me. It's those moments that I think back on and find myself missing because that was home to me. That, that's my story. Hope you liked it. To wrap things up with me, I have been asked to perform a song. I don't claim to take credit for the composition of the song, definitely. This is Things That Make It Warm by Cave Town. to you about maybe being part of this you were a little bit hesitant but um I cannot tell you how much I enjoyed that and I'm so glad that you agreed to be part of this event thank you awesome. all right and last but not least tonight we have an associate professor and the chair of the communication studies department Dr. Bradley Bond Dr. Bond's secret is that he enjoys eating breakfast cereal for dinner don't judge. And Dr. Bond, you can begin your story whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. You can hear me all right, I assume. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> this was, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to do this. It was um, therapeutic. I was having some serious writer's block that was election induced and writing out this story actually brought me back to my own academic writing. So thank you. I'm going to tell you a little story about my past that I don't know if anyone knows, and I will have my mother listen to once it's posted to the website. Uh, Nick drove us to St. Louis this night because if I had driven, we never would have made it. Every exit ramp on the interstate would have taunted me to turn around, and eventually I would have succumbed. I needed to be the passenger, trapped in Nick's rusted out Toyota Camry, hurtling toward danger with no control over our ability to reach our destination. If anyone caught us, my life would be ruined. 
My future would vanish faster than I could grasp for bits and pieces of my hopes and dreams. I was beyond scared. I was ashamed. Nick pulled into a poorly lit parking lot. We were now just a block away from the most frightening place that I had ever considered patronizing at that point in my life, the coffee cartel. Not an actual cartel, but indeed an actual coffee house. A coffee house that just so happened to cater to gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender youth. You see, Nick and I were both 19 years old, growing up in small towns in rural Southern Illinois, about 30 miles from one another. We had met on a chat service that was really popular in the late 90s called ICQ. And after months of chatting, I worked up the courage to visit Nick at his house when his parents were out of town. That felt safe, felt confidential. When Nick wanted to hang out again, I agreed. I mean, after all, we were the only two gay people in all of Southern Illinois, or, or at least that's what my naive 19-year-old self had concluded at the time. So for our second meetup, Nick proposed adventuring out to Coffee Cartel, his favorite spot in St. Louis to hang out. It's queer friendly, he said, you'll like it. I have to be honest, I had no idea what queer friendly meant and the perplexed look on my face didn't go unnoticed by Nick. He followed it up with, a lot of kids like us hang out there, you'll like it. When the light bulb went off and I realized what queer friendly must have meant, it felt like every baritone in the Chicago Gay Men's Chorus was in my head singing, absolutely not, you're not ready for this. And yet, some higher rainbow power took over my vocal cords and I very meekly responded with, yeah, sure, why not? So here we are a week later and I find myself a block away from some queer friendly place thinking, how did I get here? What am I doing here? I am not ready for this. No one outside of Nick and a few other ICQ regulars knew about this part of me. As we started to walk to Coffee Cartel, I felt an overwhelming sense of fear, anxiety, and excitement all at once. Kind of like that feeling you get when you make the very first turn in a super dark haunted house. The only thing that brought me comfort was that I felt like I looked pretty good. I had on my favorite bright yellow fleece for the night and that was very fashionable in my mind in the late 1990s. Coffee Cartel was on a corner in the Central West End, a hip St. Louis neighborhood known for its live music, brick paved streets and youthful vibe. The coffee house occupied the first floor of a small red brick building. Large pane windows had a film on them as if they were long overdue for a washing and well-worn metal tables and chairs were strewn about on a large patio clearly meant for gathering. I tried to open the door for Nick, but fear and anxiety were definitely overtaking excitement. Nick's impatience set in pretty quick, so he just swung that glass door open and nudged me inside. It was bittersweet. M literally, the air smelled of burnt coffee and fresh waffle cones. Apparently, the baristas were hired more so for their boyish looks and flirtatious demeanor, and less so for their latte skills. But hey, their ice cream was a hit. The front of the shop was very narrow, allowing you to order and move to the right for pickup as if you were on an assembly line. I hated coffee and it was way too cold for ice cream. So I ordered a cherry Italian soda and followed Nick into a small annex off to the side of that narrow front room. The annex was filled with chatter and smoke. The walls lined with flyers for everything from open mic nights to HIV AIDS support groups that nicely papered over the peeling paint and sporadic holes here and there. The room was filled with people sitting shoulder to shoulder. There were young men in skirts, girls with short purple hair, piercings on people's faces in places I didn't even know you could pierce. I stood there in my bright yellow fleece entirely overwhelmed. These people seemed so different from me. And unfortunately, that Italian soda was no elixir for fear and anxiety. My heart was starting to beat abnormally fast. Everyone's face kind of muddled in my vision as if they were the featured perpetrator on an episode of Cops. Before fight or flight could kick in though, Nick grabbed my wrist and pulled me toward a table that was meant for two, clearly occupied by at least six. He made sure I had a spot to sit and then started in on the gossip. At that point, one boisterous tall guy with spiky blonde hair and kind of a football player's build looked over at me. Hi, I'm Eric, he said. Eric was from yet another small town in rural Illinois, about 15 miles away from my small town. Eric and I started to talk about school and then television. 
And though I could tell he was judging my fashion sense, he maintained a really friendly demeanor. Without realizing it, hours had passed. My Italian soda was watered down by melted ice and talking to Eric started to feel like I was talking to a friend, but a friend that knew my secret. For a second, it almost felt like I belonged. It was at that very moment that Eric confirmed my suspicions and outwardly made fun of my fleece. Without missing a beat, I threw some snarky comment back at him. And man, I really wish I remembered what I said, but I believe it involved Big Bird. Eric laughed at my self-deprecating joke. And Eric has a very joyful laugh, a high-pitched chuckle. Eric's laughter penetrated right through that shield that I had been carrying all night and arguably had been carrying my entire life. That shield kept my secret. It kept me safe in a heteronormative world. But it was Eric's laugh that shattered that shield. My defenses were down. Eric was my age, from my side of the Mississippi. He was more comfortable with his sexuality than I ever thought I could be. And he just laughed at my joke. It was the validation that I needed at that very moment in that smoky annex of the coffee cartel. I smiled. The smell of burnt coffee made its way back into my nostrils, so I looked up to scope out who was about to sip on their caffeinated tar, but realized that my fear and anxiety had waned, and as that happened, the faces of those in that tattered annex became much more vivid. They didn't look so different anymore. In fact, these were the faces of people just like me. Sure, most of them didn't look like me, and none of them would have been caught dead in a bright yellow fleece, but that didn't matter. They were just like me. Before finding this coffee house, they were searching for a place, hungry to confide in others who understood their feelings, who felt their pain, who would celebrate their victories and comfort them in their failures. Boys who could talk about cute boys together, girls who could talk about dates with other girls, and everyone in between. I turned to Eric. We should hang out again sometime. Cool, Eric replied back. And just like that, for the first time since childhood, I felt like I was home. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bond. Um, that was an awesome story and I'm glad that it could provide you some inspiration um, in your own writing. And um, I have a feeling that your story is going to inspire a lot of others as well. Well, thank you all so much for attending today. Um, our